Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the latest live episode of the Free Marketeers podcast. Thank you all very much for being with us today. Uh, if you're if you manage to get online and have some electricity at this time of stage four deindustrialization, we greatly appreciate that you're spending time with us uh, today. I have very special guest, uh, economist Mike Schussler. Mike, good morning. How are you? Thank you, Chris. I'm well, and you? Yeah, I'm doing okay. Thanks. As I say, we're all trying to survive as best as we can, and. Why we have you on today is to help us make sense of what's going on in the country regarding unemployment, regarding the GDP numbers, and of course, a recent article that you wrote, which the, the viewers and listeners can find both on MoneyWeb and on the Free Market Foundation website. And I've also linked to that in the description below. So I, I highly advise that you all go read that. I will mention just in the intro that Mike is also a consulting economist at Brenthurst Wealth. Mike. To start off with, the unemployment numbers came out uh, last week and then we had GDP numbers this week. So the official unemployment rate is 32.6% on the expanded definition, 43.2%. But probably the scariest number out of all of that, well, they're all scary, but I think is more scary, is the 74% youth unemployment rate. Do you think those those rates are accurate? Do they reflect reality? I mean, they're from status A. Do you think they, they sort of paint a good picture? Uh, it, that's, you know, that's the thing we've been struggling with for the longest time period um, is I think there's a part of the population that probably uh, does some sort of work and doesn't uh, acknowledge that as work because South Africans believe very often that you have to have a full-time employed job. But nonetheless, I think if you assume that people, those people were going to say the same thing, then our trend will be 100% I think is pretty right. I think they get the trend right. And what these numbers tell us um, in another way is that we are at the highest unemployment rate that we've ever seen in South Africa. Um, I did work and uh, for a union called URSA, I still do. Um, and we got the numbers uh, from all the censuses for the early 90s and in the, uh, then the TBVC states and we were at an unemployment rate then of about 15%. Now, what this says to us, and that was already high, um, in today's terms, that would put us in the, in the top three big economies with that sort of unemployment rate. At 32.6%, it would put us in the top three worldwide again. Um, we know Namibia is worse now. Um, and this unemployment story is really bad. If you think of South Africa, um, our average unemployment rate since 1996, uh, using the October household surveys, uh, later the labor force survey, and then even later the quarterly labor force survey, and they all had slightly different definitions of the word unemployment. Um, the fact of the matter is that we're looking at about 26% unemployment average for those 25 years. Now, 25 years at a 26% average unemployment rate of the official number, the broader rate it will be around about 38%, um, puts us in a very unique position. There is no country outside of Southern Africa that has that sort of unemployment rate for that period of time. In the Great Depression in America, Chris, what happened is that they reached a peak unemployment rate, let's call it like our official rate, at 25%. And that was there for a month or three, and then started heading down. We in South Africa have averaged that for 25 years. Um, it, it's incredible. The Americans made movies about the Great Depression. Um, it, it left a, a, a thing on the American psyche. Um, the, the, the depression in, in Germany uh, still to this day, uh, the Germans are worried about inflation because they got the inflation part of it. In South Africa, uh, it's like we just carry on and we, we think we're going to do more government interference and more of this and more of that. And we, we don't learn that, that this has been uh, to the detriment of business trying to go on. And, uh, you know, it just hasn't helped. The GDP figures, they show us that we've still got a very poor fixed capital um, uh, uh, increase or as a percentage of our GDP. 
Um, private fixed capital is about 10%. Government's about 3%. The average emerging market out there is not 13% of GDP, but 26, double our rate. Why are people not investing here? Because what exactly what the Free Market Foundation is saying, become friendly to business, become friendly to the markets. And we don't do that. We, we just think, okay, we're going to stop even black people being able to sell something because other black people are not going to buy it. We, 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 we adding more and more rules and regulations and we wonder why jobs are not growing. Yeah, you're referring, of course, to the, the blocked sale of uh, Burger King in South Africa, That's which is, right. it, it's, it's ironic that one, that government advocates for transformation, but it seems it's, its own policies are blocking, I think, the transformation that all South Africans want. We want the economy to be bigger. You can't just redistribute mm -hmm. and have a smaller pie. I wanted to just ask you on the, the GDP numbers. The only question I had on that, um, so it came out this week that the economy grew by 4.6%, in the first three months of 2021, but isn't the correct real growth rate for the first quarter uh, minus 2.7 because of the damage that was done last year? Uh, look, we're talking about... How exactly does it work? I, I want you to explain. Yeah, we, we, we're what talking what quarter on, the one thing is it's a quarter on quarter growth, and that was 1.1%. Then when you annualize it, you get to 4.6%. But when you look back over a year, we're still 3.2% below the first quarter of last year, which was, I think, uh, uh, correctly 0.2% down on the first quarter of the year before. So for us to get back to 2019 levels, we're still about four, uh, three and a half percent away from that. And uh, that's going to take a while. Um, you know, you, 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 the real growth, uh, you know, the, the not the annualized growth is 1.1. Now, with the electricity and power outages that we're having currently in the second quarter, um, is not going to be as good as the first quarter. And the first other thing that I want to say is uh, the recovery on the positive side has been a lot better than many of us expected. We picked it up with a lot of other survey data, but certainly the low interest rates have helped. Certainly, um, those high commodity prices um, have pumped in uh, 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 more money into mining. Mineral sales in March were at 75 billion. Uh, the April ones are coming out as we speak, so we don't have them. But the point is, these are a huge amount of, and that was a quarter of our came from that sector alone directly. Never mind what they gave to the other sectors. But obviously, um, it's going to take a while for some sectors to get back. Um, I'm hoping that travel normalizes by the end of the year because I can't, I can't foresee the, 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 the tourism industry going through another summer of horror. Um, it, 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 the, you know, leisure, travel, um, all those things. So we go to a game of football or we go to um, our um, favorite movie house or so on. Um, I know of people that um, they order in. They don't go to a restaurant they're fearful. So we've got to get these things right, you know. And a lot of the things we're just not getting right at the moment, where we expect government to do something like vaccinate people, we're under, uh, you know, the, amount, uh, our, the percentage of people in South Africa that are vaccinated is below that of Africa. And it is well below our peers, which is the upper middle income group, we're at 38% now. We're at 2.4, 2.5%. Um, it's, it's, it's incredible that we get there. And even the lower middle income group is at 10% odd. So countries that are poorer than us are vaccinating more people, getting their economies going quicker than us uh, through that vaccination and very likely to. Um, and I'm concerned. I really am concerned that... Um, we, we've got this government that thinks they can just control everything just by saying things and implementing laws, um, but they, they, they can't, you know, uh, organize a piss up in a brewery, um, quite frankly. And, uh, you know, the, the Department of Health is more concerned about the reputation of the minister at the moment and, uh, than, than they are about vaccinating people. Um, we've had power outages this end of this year, being 14 years of load shedding. 
Um, and we still don't allow private players in. I mean, the, you can do this at a stroke of a pen and a year, 18 months from now, you'll be fine. Because you don't have to say how much coal, how, how much nuclear, how much. If the private guys come in, you'll see a lot of gas, for example, because you can modulate uh, them, uh, those things, and it'll be done in 18 months. That's how gas power stations come. And a lot, another advantage is a lot of that money will go to a country right next to us called Mozambique. Another part of it could go to Namibia. Um, there's, there's a lot of things to be said for this. And, and why are we not doing this? All the countries around us just says to me that the government uh, likes to be in control. And why do they like to be in control? Well, they want to uh, feed a bit more themselves. They want to, that's the only reason I can, I can foresee. Um, I have no doubt that um, we have great people in this country. We have um, a lot of things going for us. Um, I see trains not working, but I see ordinary, ordinary South Africans pick up other people at the station and take them through. I'm not talking taxis now. I see a taxi industry come through for them. I see, um, you know, people uh, 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 doing what they need to do to help others. Um, I, I really think, uh, you know, government has got to get out of the way now. Uh, they clearly uh, are in the way of the economic growth by not allowing free electricity. Uh, you cannot get trains um, delivering goods anymore. It's going by road because the rail tracks are stolen. Um, you know, that's also a government responsibility is our security and security of infrastructure and investing in that infrastructure. Now, if you're overseas or even here, doesn't matter, you want to invest something, you want to know that people aren't going to steal it, you know, left, right and center. And if we <laughs> take out the million people working in the private security industry right now um, in this country in one form or another, uh, we would have had virtually no employment growth, you know. So no matter which big plans they come up with, we don't see um, much uh, of, of that. One big thing, though, is if we, we, we've we got a chance with this commodity cycle now, we have uh, literally not quite last chance saloon, I think that's overdriven, but we have a good chance now to do a bit of catching up in the next three or four years. If interest rates remain low around the world, commodity prices should remain high. We must relax those rules and regulations, get those commodities going, get them out of here, uh, fix the rail, fix uh, the stuff to help us get it through. And, you know, we, we, we should have a boom at least, I don't know, of, of, of half a million to a million jobs directly from that, um, you know, into the mining, manufacturing, um, rail and, and, and transport generally and um, the like. Um, so I think that could be something that we can use. So that our signs for me that we are getting some things right, uh, it, it, that we can get some things right, and that in certain areas we are, you know, making advances. And look, I don't blame, every, you cannot blame uh, the tourism shutdown on government. That was a, a, a different disaster. But the disaster that government is adding to is that they didn't get their ducks in a row about the vaccin vaccinations. And they they overdid the lockdown in the beginning. We locked down, first of all, we shouldn't lock down, but we locked down very, very early. Um, and the cases still went up all the time anyway. And it's very difficult in a, in a developing country uh, where sometimes people are living four or five to a room. Not everywhere. We have a lot of houses, but that, you know, it doesn't uh, uh, say you, you, you're going to get the disease out it's going to be very difficult under those circumstances. We should have thought a bit differently. So we made it a bit worse, but I think there are some signs of recovery. And they certainly, you know, look at the farming. Although government doesn't give subsidies to farmers, uh, they live with a lot of uncertainty. They've done very, very well. Um, so I would like to see a lot more positive signs. And governments, it's actually very easy to, 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 to take your fingers away from the economy and to say, right, I'm going to allow private water, I'm going to allow private electricity, I'm going to do this and this and this and this. Um, 
it, it's not hard. No, I agree completely. And to talk about what you talked about with South Africans helping each other, we have to mention Gift of the Givers, of course, who are doing incredible work around around South Africa, even in Gauteng, where public hospitals are closed effectively without water. A gift of the Givers is going and drilling for water and, and uh, enabling those hospitals to function in at least some way. What a wonderful organization. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not a big religious person, but I've been to quite a few church churches and church bazaars in my time where I see a lot of money and a lot of things collected for ordinary people. Whether it, And then every year we have on Nelson Mandela's birthday, we have uh, people doing a lot of ordinary people doing things, trying to do things right. Around the end of the year, I see a lot of people doing, um, you know, so on. But we, as South Africans, I think we've done quite a bit, and that's under-acknowledged as well. I think if if if, if government wanted to do that, that's on. But we had, a, you know, on a, on a different note, um, back sort of in a in an economic uh, set thing. So we adhere to things. We say uh, we're going to have the best green city in the world. And we're going to do this and this by 2030. Now, if I was the opposition party, what I would do is I would say, right, Mr. Mayor, you want everybody to have a bicycle or to walk, and uh, 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 and uh, use 70% of us must use public transport, and we don't want to see cars much. So the first thing I would do as an opposition, I would buy a bicycle for the mayor, a pair of shoes, a month worth of bus tickets, demand the keys from his car, and any family member's car, and I'd have them impounded, and then they must uh, use that public transport. And I would say that would show you exactly what the difference is between talk and action, because it's very easy saying, I am the mayor, we are going to be green and give this wonderful speech. But there's people without jobs, there's hunger, there's everything. And you're talking absolute crap right now, because you're not part of that you driving in a big, nice car with a motorcade of policemen uh, all around you. And sorry, then I don't believe this crap. I, I, you know, I sometimes wish I could bang a few opposition heads together very, very hard, crack some nuts and say, listen, don't be nice. Be clever. Be clever about what you do and do the publicity stunts and do them well. And uh, then we'll have a lot more fun in this country. But coming back to the economics now, you know, we've heard uh, we, we, we got all this green energy, which is supposedly cheaper, but people forget the battery or the storage of the power sometimes. But there are all these projects. And at least in the daytime, in theory, we should have enough power. Now, why is ESCOM not buying them? Because it's a bit expensive. But now it's moved on to where we're going to buy as expensive power from power ships and from wherever else. But in the meantime, every kilowatt hour lost on average to this economy costs us 17 Rand. If it does cost us 1 Rand 70 an hour, then we're still up by 10 times that amount. So we will go through a price shock again, probably, but I'm not saying pr increase the price of electricity, you can do it uh, very clever. And why not allow self-generation? So already I could, I could stop daytime load shedding virtually overnight. Right now I could do that and allow more wind and allow more solar. And uh, 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 um, the mines are begging the government, please, can we just have our own power? We don't want to be stuck with people down in the ground, um, you know, three kilometers underground, and we can't pump air to them. Um, so th th this is this is critical, and you know, we don't hear anything from the government. Now that's not right, and that says to you that the cost-benefit analysis and the, all the other economic numbers that should be in this equation with all these sort of things are not even being looked at. And that in itself says to me, I am in charge here, I'm the big boy, and I will do as I want. And that hurts ordinary people. And those ordinary people that are hurting, that are losing their jobs, means that there's more inequality today 
than during apartheid. The IMF has pointed this out. The OECD working papers, which uh, uh, have come out over the years, have pointed this out. Maybe a bit more subtle, but they have. And I think if we look at the bigger and bigger, ever higher unemployment numbers, then quite frankly, um, what's happening is we, we, we are uh, increasing inequality. We're increasing poverty. We're one of the few countries in the world where there's an increasing trend in poverty now, not just because of COVID. There'll be a few joining us in, for a year or two, but that's not right. But you see, you have this nice scapegoat, the past, called apartheid, where you can pump in everything. While you're busy with your hands in the till, you blame other people. And it's not nice saying this, but it is a fact. Um, we've heard the Zondo Commission for three years now, and we haven't even got to the bottom of stuff there. And that is for state capture. That's not, um, you know, uh, a little municipality, uh, 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 you know, boozing it up. Or the head of the uh, army retires, and uh, 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 the South African Defence Force and you know you they've all the uh, tables are layered out with the most expensive whiskies in the world um please you know the, the, this is this is this is obnoxious um and you know by 2019 so a year before COVID, 54 percent of the richest 10 percent of south africans households according to the household survey done by stats sa were black the highest inequality is amongst Africans in South Africa. And I've got this suspicion that our elite is getting far, far fewer because I see a lot more people with talent and money leaving. And we see it in the numbers of other countries as well. Now I'm doing a monologue, sorry, but Chris, but just that, just think about it. It is absolutely crazy that we are not concerned about unemployment. We are not concerned about the electricity outages. Nobody is making, apart from a few newspaper articles, that the trains have disappeared. In some cases, the buses have disappeared. In other cases, the buses haven't even started. Ukuleni, the Ria Via version, or whatever they call it, the BRT, uh, Bus Rapid Transport uh, System, is spent 18 billion rand two years ago already, and they're still not operational. They, their buses are in a yard and, 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 and they're rotting. They're starting to rust. Um, they put nice lifts in everything. It's beautiful, but it doesn't work. And that's just the thing. You know, we, we do all these big plans and we hardly implement it because the big plan is still just a plan. Even if you've built the bridges, the roadway and everything, if the bus isn't picking up passengers and delivering them in mass, to where they need to be on time, it ain't working. It's as simple as that. And that's what we've got. We've, we've got all these things where, and, and everything always costs more. We've built two power stations that aren't even being completed. This must be the most expensive coal power stations in the world per kilowatt hour that if it ever delivers. And it's still not working. Now, you cannot run an economy. You cannot run a modern economy like that. We are going to be blamed for the fall of Africa if we're not careful. That's how bad it's getting. Um, you know, in my personal view, um, there's it, it, it's not that much energy to change. You, you've just got to unleash the market to a large extent. The state can stay there and provide the grant support, can provide the education, make sure it's better, obviously. But we can't carry on like this with no power, no water, all those sort of things. Well, Mike, as we're talking, I saw a tweet that President Ramaphosa is going to today at uh, 12, uh, 12 p.m. at lunchtime, uh, he's going to make an announcement as part of government's effort to achieve a swift and lasting economic recovery. So I read that as government's going to abandon expropriation without compensation, they're going to abandon NHI, they're going to abandon prescribed assets. <laughs> <laughs> Get I mean, what else, is gonna, what else is going to lead to a lasting recovery? I mean, exactly. And I mean, we, we're already one of the highest tax countries in the world, as uh, we now know. And that, uh, on the company tax side, uh, the amount of uh, company tax paid as a percentage of GDP is the seventh highest in the world. 
Um, our neighbors are not far behind. In fact, I think Lesotho is even uh, ahead of us. Um, uh, the, the, the countries with high tax burdens have also very often got uh, a, a not great economic growth. And when they don't have great economic growth and they don't have uh, a great fixed investment records, then um, that leads to uh, uh, not, not creating enough employment. Um, because, you know, part of our problem isn't that we've just lost jobs, is we've actually grown jobs. But, you know, our jobs haven't grown with the net 600,000 that we need every year to get the new net new people in. A, a million people come into the job market, 400,000 leave. So you need 600,000 uh, new jobs. So we end up uh, creating 200,000 new jobs. And that means that um, two out of every three people that enter net entries into the job market end up not having a job. Or put it the other way, in South Africa, less than four out of every 10 adults work. Now, think about that for a minute. Now, obviously, no country in the world is 100% because you have people of, of uh, uh, adult age that are still studying. Uh, you have homemakers, all those sort of things. But, you know, we are really, really, really low. We're, um, there are countries that are lower than us with not the same inequality, but that's due to a cultural thing where um, married women and women who have given birth uh, to children are not uh, encouraged or not allowed to work. I don't know how it works in all those countries, and it's the Muslim world I'm talking about. But that means you still have an equal chance. Each household still has one owner, whereas in the rest of the world, you have typically one and a half owners in a, in a household in one way or another. So you have about 67% uh, of people uh, in the, you know, working um, as such. And uh, in South Africa, it's um, 38 and a half, uh, up to the age of 64. But if we assume because people live longer these days, then it drops to about 35%, which is the way that the World Bank measures it. And, you know, we will be in the bottom five, bottom six. And with us there, again, our friends in Namibia, the Situ, you know, and, and a lot of those countries. So uh, Zimbabwe, a bit above us. Um, but, you know, that tells you where the, where, 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 where the poverty is because we haven't got enough jobs. If most people are not working, whereas in most countries it's the other way around, more people are working, adults now, and let's just use a broad term. Let's just say uh, everybody over the age of 15, you know, up to whatever, 100, um, around the world that, that average is, is, is well above 50. Um, in some countries, it's even around 80%, like China, but they'll go through a slowdown soon with um, the aging population, there's no doubt, and they have fewer children, obviously, so there's a big need um, to bring people in. But if you have, if you have that, you know, at, say, uh, two-thirds of adults working, um, and we've got less than uh, four out of ten, um, you know, that's a big difference. That's 25, 26 people out of every hundred that... Uh, would in most other countries have a job who haven't got a job here. So that's another way, you know, when you ask in the beginning and um, unemployment, that's maybe a better indicator, um, if you wish. Because all the other things are definition-based and, you know, did you look for a job in the last week? Uh, are you willing to start in the next week? Uh, or can you start by next week, Monday? And people have got all sorts of things in their ideas. So rather look at who's actually in a job and who's in a paying job. And that's another issue, you know. So we see uh, not many, but quite a few, about 60,000 people work for the family firm for free, you know, in the spas or shop or whatever. But that's fine. That happens all over, over the world. So we have to really look at that um, in, in, in a way more and more that we've got to be clever. You know, the, the rich world is now closing the tax gap for big co corporates. Um, we're talking about, I think, uh, it's, you've got to have over $20 billion turnover or something like that before. Then you have a minimum tax of, or a tax of 15% minimum uh, for those com uh, companies that work across on the internet and stuff like that. Uh, uh, you know, that, that would help us a bit as well, but the thing is what we must get clear is that's going to be the next target. Everybody's going to go to 15%. Uh, some are below that now and they'll go up, but others that are still going to be on their way down, 
And, you know, if we want to attract that sort of company, and what we also see is a lot of startup companies around the world get big, big tax breaks, really gigantic ones. And I think because we haven't got that formation company formation yet, that's something that we need to think of. I'm not saying um, it needs to be a big company now, but if somebody starts with three or four or five people, you give them a tax break for a year or two that they can get going, you know, and uh, you're not going to lose much, promise you. But it gives that person peace of mind. If things go wrong, he's not going to owe the tax man not too much. You know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about company taxes and dividends and everything like that. And then individual um, owners and partnerships and stuff. There are many other things that we can do. Anyway, I'm jumping around. But that that we've got to think everything that we do has got to be how do we create work? How do we spread the work all around? And there's an industry in South Africa called agriculture. It has taken a lot of stuff on the chin. But they are in the rural areas. And tourism is very often in the rural areas. And they are the only people providing jobs there. So what can we do to help agriculture? We might not be able to afford subsidies, but don't we want to fix those roads? Don't we going to put more certainty in, in there? Because now we're talking about taking the people's land away. But don't we want to say to people, you know, this is the way for land certainty as well. Because what's going to stop the government taking the new person's land away? So ultimately, I think we've got to really think this through. And we have things we can do because we have a big pension pot. Those pension pots, if they see the returns, they will invest there. We have a lot of company savings. Of course, companies have been scared to invest. So if we can turn the tide of thinking and the tide of, of, of um, not just negativity, but um, the stupidity of government, to put it very frankly, if we can turn that around, that would um, really help and we would have a great financial boost and allow the skills in where needed. We, we're getting a lot of unskilled people coming here. And that's unsettling a lot of people, creating xenophobia, because the people at the bottom are fighting for peanuts. And, you know, it makes it very difficult. But, yeah, that's what I think. I think we've got to look at how we as a country can create the jobs so that we can bring, uh, get rid of a lot of poverty and bring down inequality. And the fact what I'm saying now is that inequality isn't the fault of the rich person. Inequality is a fault of that we don't have many rich people. If we had lots of rich people, we wouldn't have this uh, inequality. And if you look at the South African tax rates, you know, the average what, uh, uh, salary in the formal sector at about 23,000 Rand in many, many countries, and that's rich people in South Africa in a way, um, they would all fall in the top 20% um, on our surveys. Uh, they would fall in the top, uh, bottom 20% in most American states, easy. They would be on food stamps. They would literally get a housing allowance. They'd be on food stamps. In Austria, in Netherlands, all those places, people will get a lot of stuff free. Uh, let's separate the, um, that in some countries you have a um, social security, you know, like pension that we've got private here. Um, but, you know, you might have to pay... Um, 12 or 19% depending on country. But when I was at Transnet, you know, Transnet put in seven and a half, I put in seven and a half, and that was the, so they stuffed up the pension, but that I didn't see as a tax. I saw that as a delayed payment. So uh, to me, and I think most people see it, that's why it's called social security and not taxation. But the, the tax in South Africa, um, you know, you, you, you'd pay zero tax in many European countries, even with a strong rand right now, in quite a few still, I'm quite sure, um, at the average rate that somebody earns money at in our formal sector. Well, Mike, I, one of the biggest things I wanted to highlight from your article, um, and I will mention at this opportunity to the viewers, if you have any questions for Mike, please put those in the comments and I'll put those to him. But Mike, in your article, which I remind people they can go and read at either MoneyWeb or at the Free Market Foundation's website, you talk about um, high taxes and high inequality. And also, 
I want you to explain to us why, let us say that we had 100% tax and SARS actually collected all that tax, never mind the tax that would sort of uh, fall through the, through the net, as it were, but why a lot of government spending won't necessarily mean 100% employment because a big, a big push now is for the quote-unquote developmental state that the state needs to be doing more, spending more, that kind of thing. How do you see this link between high tax and high inequality and also why just more government spending won't necessarily be what South Africa needs? You see capital. You need capital and you need labor to make things work. So when we measure economics, we can measure it uh, from the production side. We can measure it from the spending side, which is what so on. And then you get the factor cost side. Now, the factor cost looks at the cost of your production with capital and what labor costs you. And um, costs of capital has got to have a return. And you don't want to put your money uh, somewhere where there's no chance for you to get something else out. It's not like a lottery where you just uh, uh, hope for the best. You actually work out and you say, right, I'm going to put down a milk plant. I'm going to uh, have these farmers around me. I can see them. I can buy the milk from them. I can pasteurize it. It's, this is the electricity cost. Uh, this is the cost of the machinery. This is the cost of the building. This is the cost of the transport. Um, all those things I'm going to work out. And then I'm going to say, but I want to return. I can either put my money in a bank anywhere in the world. What's the interest rate in South Africa? Let's just use the South African one. Well, the interest rate in South Africa, say, is 7%. So now I need to know I want to make more than 7% because I can get a risk-free rate as the government rate. At a 10-year bond is, say, 9%. That's another uh, a benchmark that one could use. So I want to return. And that return is going to be an after-tax return as well. And that return had better be better than the 7 or the 9%. Um, so that's the first thing. And... Remember, if I'm going to pay a 28% tax, that goes off that. Then on my dividends, I get a dividend tax that goes off that. So I've got to look as an investor what I'm getting out. And if I'm not getting enough out to compensate for that risk, in other words, remember there's a lot of risk. There's, there's a risk called inflation. Prices change and go up over the time. So I don't want to just keep the, my money under the bed. There, I'm a risk taker. As a business person, I would be a risk taker. I would measure that and say to myself very logically, I want to outperform, uh, uh, I want to do better, I want to give um, shareholders the chance of earning more uh, than they would in the bank over a period of a year or so, obviously for a long time period. Because And then there's a risk of closure, failure. And, uh, you know, the average company in South Africa is well below 10 years old. Um, one of the oldest companies closed now, it was 1934, was SAA. Um, I, I can tell you now that many of the wine farms might have uh, numbered bottles on them and that they were started in, I don't know, 1750 or something like that. But, you know, it's gone through many ownerships and it's had breakups and all that type of stuff. So we need to be very realistic about this. And I don't think the average company in South Africa, in fact, lasts four or five years. Uh, many people just don't make it. And they have to try and try again. So we need to understand that some of these guys are serial entrepreneurs. Uh, but they also know more about the risk after their first venture, I can tell you. You only need to lose money in a big way once, and you don't want to lose money again. And uh, then you put everything together. You say, okay, I've got people. This is what I have to pay the people. This is what I put in in the money. On the money I put in, I want this sort of return. So remember, after I've taken away all the costs, now tax on people, tax me, the, the, the owner of the company. You tax my income, uh, in other words, my personal income, my dividends, my company has, pays a tax. All those things I take into account. And I also would like to see at the other end, obviously, something come back. But before we do that, just that. So now I get 10% back. The bank rate, however, is um, 7%, and I'm being taxed at 28%. So it's very close to the bank rate. So why did I put in all this effort? 
for an extra 0.2%? No, I don't think I'll, I'll, you know, I would do that. Um, or then you tax my dividends at another 20%. So if I take the money out of the company um, and I pay myself some dividends, and I assume I pay everything out in dividends afterwards, um, which is also not always healthy to do because you need to build up rain fund and everything like that, and you need to look for expansion possibilities sometimes. But anyway, now I take that dividend and that's taxed at another 20%. So wait a minute, my 7.2% now all of a sudden only is 50 uh, or 5.8% or, or return. That's below what I get in the bank. Now you say, yes, but we can tax you in the bank at 40%, which is your top marginal tax rate. True. But remember, I also get off on the first part of it, and I could put it into a, a sort of trust vehicle or pension fund thing where I can uh, 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 manage some of the tax risks. But even then, I can take it to another country, another place, some, but those are the things I would compare it with. But I would think very hard if I'm getting 7% in the bank and after tax at, say, even 4%, and I'm only getting 5% out from my company efforts. Because remember, now I'm busy full-time and I've got all the worries. I've got to look after people. Um, you throwing laws and regulations at me. If I leave the money somewhere else, they have to take care of it. Maybe I would like to do that then and not have all those hard, hard times. Uh, or, or, or hard work and, and worries. Um, so, you know, it's a it's a moving target. But the thing is, you want people to have that. And those taxes reduce that return. And the more they reduce that return, the more unlikely it is that somebody's going to put their money down there when they compare the returns to something else. And today, it's a, it's a whole world out there, I can reduce my risk by not only investing in South Africa, I can invest in Turkey, Pakistan, and um, Australia, and America, and, you know, Brazil. And uh, that way I get a mixture of everybody and everything. And I'm not just in the RAND, whereas if I invest here, I'm in the RAND. Uh, I might have labor problems. Uh, I might be in front of the CCMA. Uh, all those things. So you've got to entice me with more certainty as much as you can. In other words, keep the inflation rate low. Make sure that I can keep my property and my uh, intellectual property and my ideas that I put down in the firm. Make sure that the tax rates ain't too much. And entice me by saying we need business people. We love business people. And if we do that, then I think the tide might start turning. But I need that high tax. I don't need that high tax. And if I don't invest, there's no job. And there's a lot of me, or not so much, let's put it this way, only 2%, 2.5% of all uh, 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 um, adults are employers in South Africa, one of the lower numbers in the world. So if you've got that sort of thing, then that's a scarce thing. You want that to grow. And once you grow that, then you know, all the other things come with it. And we must also remember another thing, and, and that is, I'm now mentioned something very sophisticated maybe, but the typical employer in South Africa only has nine people working for him or her. And that says to me, these guys will be working out what they can get, maybe in the bank, maybe in the stock market. They've all got a bit of an idea. Won't be maybe as precise as I try to describe it, but they will work out very quickly that, you know, I, I'm, I'm working hard and I'm not getting um, such a great extra reward because I've heard about Jack, my friend, around the corner here who just put his money into a, a, a bank account or into whatever. I mean, not talking Bitcoin now, I'm talking actual investments. And uh, that that sort of news gets to other and then people start thinking you know so it's not maybe a precise worked out it's just oh you, you know you put your 100 rand in you got seven grand back out i put 100 rand in and you know i only got six out or i got 10 out and is it really worth that extra three for all the effort that i put in and you know these are the things that i think people think about um smaller employers think also of their cash flow 
So it's very important that we also try to support cash flow in wherever we can. But, you know, we, we are a sophisticated country maybe, but we're not that sophisticated when it comes to building businesses. So we need to also put in a lot more effort at the schooling level. We need to put in uh, uh, um, easier accounting rules and those sort of things. And that's why I think the, the tax ban mustn't be too hard on the smaller businesses. They must, you know, be be gentle on that. Yes, try to get the money in. But, you know, if you're going full out for taxes and you're going to um, squash the thousands of smaller employers in that process, you're just going to end up with more unemployment and more people to support. So it's a very fine line and you need people to believe in the tax system again because it, it lost a lot of credibility. But if you've got high taxes, it takes away returns and people work that out. And that is the fact. And that means jobs don't grow. And when jobs don't grow, poverty grows. And when poverty grows, inequality grows. And uh, you sit with even less um, uh, uh, employers. We, we were finding a lot of employers leaving of all races, all uh, uh, income groups even, um, because they don't always feel so comfortable here. And we've got to ask ourselves that question. Why are employers not feeling comfortable? I... I think it's, I mean, it's prescient what you say. We can have all the job summits and all the grand compacts that we want, but without the capital and without businesses actually starting and growing, you're not going to have job creation. Mike, the final thing I wanted to get your thoughts on, um, and we can also cover some of the comments in, in a bit, but it's just around the proportion, the sort of percentage of GDP, I guess, and spending that goes to uh, government wages. In your article, you point out emerging uh, countries with high government wage burdens, uh, that's a very good indicator of inequality. And more often than not, civil servants who get the large chunk of GDP are in the top 10% or 15% of earners in those countries. Uh, you also mentioned how you know the some of the bigger SOEs in South Africa are some of the biggest employers. How does that factor into your sort of analysis and, and discussion around you know the you stuff think, around inequality and that kind of thing? Yeah, when you're using other people's money, you're not thinking in returns. So, unless you're a fund manager, but when you, and even they don't think properly. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, when you're government, you know, it's okay, we'll just give you an increase. Um, we'll upgrade your job, we'll do whatever. So, we have a lot of people, a few people in the big picture working for government, and they get paid very well. In our tax data, um, they make up between 30 um, I worked it out, between 37 and 42% um, will be government employees. And remember, the people that pay taxes are already in the richer third of South Africa. We, we only have 7.5 million taxpayers, so um, pay-as-you-earn taxpayers, um, with, in other words, income tax. And when you look at that, out of 40 million um, adults, well, it's not even a quarter, and I'm saying out of those seven and a half million, now look at the top 10% of them. So I'm looking at the top 700, odd, because they don't all fill in every year. Uh, you know, it's, it's a bit difficult to trace it. But if I look at that top 10%, there's no doubt, and, and, and look at the categories from where they come, where these uh, the, the averages are, then it's very clear that the uh, 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 government employees are getting a lot of money. And they don't create other jobs. They spend our money. And that is a, a concern. You know, they, they, they are taxing. It's because of them that we have to tax higher. So we, 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 we sit with 15.2% or nearly half our spending goes to wages. 15%, um, 15.2%. And again, of all the emerging markets, even the developed countries, who are in the top 10 uh, uh, highest paid uh, countries or civil servants or, or taking most of the GDP, I mean, not highest paid necessarily. Obviously, if you're an American civil servant, you get paid in dollars, you get paid more than the South African one. Um, but ultimately, it's Namibia, South Africa, Lesotho, Eswatini, Botswana, 
Mozambique, I think, is there. Um, you know, Zimbabwe cannot even, their, their tax rate compared to ours is 13% of GDP. You know, 95% of that goes on salaries. 95%. You know, so they're still in the top, maybe not 10, but in the top 20, um, you know, uh, uh, wage bills. So you, 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 in the world, and, and you have to question that, you know, you, 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 you need money for books, you need money for medicine, you need money for uh, infrastructure. If you don't have that, then it, it falls over. And we need to understand that. And the people in government must um, get off being this elite because they are the reason partly as well for the inequality, therefore, because they're not the ones that are creating the jobs. They are taking from the job creators, making some job creators or entrepreneurs unlikely to, 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 to start businesses. Yet they get paid very often far higher. The average employer in South Africa, now these are two different data sets, okay, are getting 8,000 rand a month. Okay, the average civil servant is closer to 30,000 rand a month. So a civil servant is earning, without the risks, four times more than the guy in government. That's on a personalized basis. So what do I want to do? I want to become a government employee. I have very little risk, less responsibility, and I get paid fine, and I'm going to have a pension when I'm finished. Well, that's what I hope. So a lot of people in transit also hope that didn't work. But think about that. So that's on a personal level. What it means on a macro level is that I end up spending 15.2% of my GDP on less than 4% of the population. That, I think, describes the big picture. And that 4%, uh, not all of them, obviously, but a good half of them are all in the top 10% of earners. So in the tax side, you know, it's, it's huge. It's, it's, it's really, really big. And that is a, a worrisome factor. And yes, we do need government. I'm not one of those people that say we don't need government. Government has a responsibility in education. Uh, defense, justice, arguably health care, but it does not have to cost us this much. And it's a conversation we've got to have. We don't like that conversation either because a lot of the, the most protected and most unionized sector in South Africa is the government sector. It has a huge hold on the current ruling party. It has everything to lose. So that's the big battle. I feel sorry for our finance minister, but that's the big battle. And it's not a one-year battle. It is going to be a decade-long battle. And whoever makes up the government next, because there will be a next government, that's for sure. Um, not saying party politically, just it's just within factions with the ANC or whatever. That's going to become their headache again because we've now kicked the can really, really far down the road. It's lying against the pavement. It, it, it can only get squashed now. And that's where we are. We, we're really at the end of this thing. Um, but again, we'll probably first squash it before we start realizing, wait, we can't. Um, so it's not quite two minutes to midnight. It's maybe like 10 minutes to midnight. But the point is, all the other hours are gone in the last 27 years. It's not like we have decades left. We have to sort this out very quickly. And believe me, uh, I think part of the reason that you talk so much about the past is because you realize that the future is pretty bleak, pretty uncertain. And the only people that support you are those that aren't bleak. <laughs> they are, you know, in the pound seats, but they don't want to hear. And they will be the first ones that shout, you are the problem, you the past. You the past, 
have brought this inequality. But now the numbers are coming and they're showing us that there's more inequality now than there's ever been. In fact, if you go back to 1951, South Africa was more equal, and remember there were no homelands in, than New Zealand. If you tell that to people today, they cannot believe it. Even, even the World Bank says, well, wait, we, we're not sure of this report. But it was then peer-reviewed. It was done in that time period. And if comparison countries would have done similar stuff. So where is New Zealand today and where is South Africa today? And if we go back to the early 90s, um, we were less unequal, or uh, 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 yeah, we had le uh, less inequality than Brazil. Today, Brazil has less inequality than us because they've got better, and so have most emerging markets, because they've been able to create those jobs and they've been able to get that growth rate. We have not. And why it's a particular Southern African problem as well is something I think we need to think about because some of these countries in Southern Africa are very unequal. Although they are maybe dependent on South Africa in one way or another, they've been, um, for more than 50 years, they've been democratic. Um, in some countries, it's 55 years, such as Zambia, Malawi. Um, we're not talking... Uh, so, so why is this part of Africa so unequal? Why are we not getting the jobs going here? Is it because we're also one of the most highly taxed places on the planet? Is it one of the places where we put too much emphasis on the corporate side of taxation and not enough on the consumption side of um, uh, taxation? It's also a question we've got to have. And do we really uh, help Confidence, business confidence particularly, but consumer confidence in these countries? Do we uh, have very small civil servant elites? Yes. And on all those questions. So we, we, have to, we have to also ask the bigger picture here. And it doesn't help blaming the past if it's not the past. Yes, the past plays a bad role. Yes, it was there. Yes, the white civil servants also got overpaid. But you're not going to so solve it by even overpaying, uh, more overpaying the new civil servants. It, that, it, it means we knew the problem then. We, 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 can, we, we were part of it, but we carried on with it. We made it even worse. So we've got to turn this around. And, you know, I remember the Free Market Foundation, a guy called Don, uh, who unfortunately passed away. He wrote a book. And um, Cadwell, I think was his name, I met him at the flea market in the apartheid years. And he was saying, you know, people don't believe you when you say that part of the problem is the government, government salaries, government what they do and how they install confidence and, and that they get in everybody's way. And the older I get, the more I realize that guy was very wise. And I will just put it and leave it there. But I wanted to finish that because I think it's something important that one realizes that something like the Free Market Foundation has got a, a, a good history of saying um, the same thing and being consistent. Uh, yeah, you know, times change. There's one or two things are different today than we would have thought 50 years ago. But I remember in the 80s, you know, the same stuff. And now I think the numbers are really coming in and telling us that story. Oh, I want to echo that very much. I wish we had still we still had Don Caldwell with us. I've only managed to read his books. I never got to meet him, unfortunately, but I wish I could have. Um, Mike, we have to thank you again for giving us almost an hour of your time. The discussion today, I think, has been great. All the insights you've given us. Uh, I, I again recommend that people go and read your article that they can find at the link in the, in the description. So thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you. To the viewers and listeners, we hope you found this discussion illuminating. Please go forward, uh, spread these ideas, engage with people around you, share these insights from Mike and from the Free Market Foundation. Let's keep pushing this discussion. There are glimpses of hope, glimpses of light, but it's up to us to keep on pushing it. It's not going to come. No one's going to come and deliver it to us. We have to keep on, on pushing, and hopefully we can. 
We hope that all of you have a good day going forward. Hopefully you have some electricity for parts of the day. Uh, you can find all of our articles and research on www.freemarketfoundation.com. Please also remember to like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share the video on your different social media platforms. We'll talk to you all again very soon. Until next time, take care.